Welcome to the Bowtie Guy Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to discuss, mm, under the umbrella of differentiation, multiple intelligences. Now, differentiation, it used to be a buzzword. Now it's taboo. It's almost like it's a wordy dirty, if you know what I'm saying. Everyone has a million and one interpretations and understandings and applications about what differentiation truly is. Differentiation to the Bowtie Guy is equipping students within their tool belt. See, we all have tool belts all around our waists, but strategies, tools that can be put in our tool belts by the teacher that can be taught by the teacher to the student that can equip them to battle against the world that says that they cannot. That's what true differentiation is. But today we're gonna to be focusing on multiple intelligences. So what in the blue moon of Kentucky are we talking about when we talk about multiple intelligences? Here's some important things you need to remember about the multiple intelligences. Well, educational professor Howard Gardner, he explored nine ways to think and learn so far. Now I say so far because you know what? This is uh, an evolutionary idea, revolutionary and evolutionary in the sense that it's something that is being uh, thought about uh, in many think tanks in education, and it's something that uh, can be constructed upon. All right, so Howard Gardner, he's an educational professor. He explored the nine ways to think and learn that we know of so far, okay? There's probably more to be discovered. Now, here's what you need to understand. You, as a teacher, you, as a student, you are stronger in some areas or intelligences than others. Do you believe that? Everyone has strengths and everyone has limitations. Some of us like to call them weaknesses. Hey, that is something that you need to focus on. A limitation is something that you may not be perpetually awesome at, but you know, that's what it's all about. We're, We're all perpetually trying to make an effort to become better, okay? And so when you capitulate, when you capitalize upon your <clears throat> quote unquote weaknesses or limitations, that's where you got it going on like Donkey Kong. You need to understand there's no one best way to learn. Every way that you, every method that you choose to learn is important. A good teacher may find that learning comes easier or is more fun in a particular area of strength. Now you need to think about experiences in all nine ways of thinking so you can jack up, pump up the ones that you are less proficient in. Many things that you do as a teacher or a student require you to use more than one intelligence to accomplish a task. Multiple intelligence aren't meant to label you. And here's the sad thing, when we're talking MBTI or personality tests or these cognitive ability tests, you have to be so careful in typecasting yourself because you know what when you slap an alphabet soup label on someone typically they'll try to fit in that mold fit in that cookie cutter instead of using it to capitulate upon their strengths and understand their weaknesses or limitations multiple multiple intelligence were not meant to label they're simply it's simply information that we can use that can inform a student's learning preference that we can become more effective, more effectual educators. So how can you use multiple intelligences? You need to find information about your preferences that can help you make good choices as a teacher, as a student. When you're asked to decide how you'll learn something or if a student is given a choice, and that's a great, choice is a great word. When you're talking about differentiation, when you give a kid a menu Give them a platform, give them a stake, because we're all stakeholders, right? Give them a stake in their learning. Baby, that's differentiation with a capital D. All right, so what are these multiple intelligences? Let's get rooty booty fresh and fruity with it. Let's talk about what we've discovered so far. Okay, we all learn differently. That is something that we can accept. Now, verbal linguistic learners, they enjoy and they understand oral and written language. They prefer to communicate with others through speaking and writing. They often like to read. They learn best through language. That is speaking, listening, reading, telling, discussing, and writing. That's having a think tank. You know what? Conversation in the classroom is a good thing because when you're articulating the language of the standard, baby, that's lots of fun, if you know what I'm saying. L-O-T-S, dot, 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 dot. Now, 
Let's talk about the logical mathematical learners. Those are your logicians. Those are your mathematicians. They're mathletic, if you will. They love numbers of all sorts. That's how they think. They, they, they think in numbers and math naturally, but also numbers associated with science, social studies, and language arts. They're thinking in charts and graphs and infographics to help them conceptualize and understand and chew and masticate the world all around them so it can become more understandable for them. Now, visual and spatial learners make mental pictures and images to help themselves learn and remember. These kinds of learners learn best when material is represented visually in non-linguistic representations such as graphic organizers, pictures, diagrams, webs, thinking maps, etc. You know what? You've heard that old song, I like to move it, move it. Yeah, so the bodily kinesthetic learners, they need to be moving because they're not the sit and get kind of kid, if you know what I'm saying. They like to express themselves and their ideas through movement. They, and, and by thinking about that, Think about the application of vocabulary. Think about the application of Go Noodle. Getting kids to move. It is research-based that if kids can get up and move it, move it, then they will be more prone to enjoy, to be a stakeholder in their learning. Now, I love music. Music is a huge part of my life. I think in rhythm. I, I don't dance with any sort of rhythm, though. Musical learners, they respond to pitch, rhythm, and tone. They can easily see, you see what I did there? See and identify patterns. Now, you might think that they're interconnected, music and your uh, your logical mathematical learners, because you know what? If you think about the world around us, some people identify patterns and it helps them perceive and, and have a perception of the world around them, okay? So the musical learners have a heightened listening ability. They have a hyperacuity to sound. They may enjoy singing, rapping, or playing an instrument. They may or may not have any musical skill set, but they do respond strongly to music. They learn best when the learning is linked to their sense of patterning, dancing, rhythm, and music. Now, you need to understand that sometimes there's people people. What am I talking about? Interpersonal learners are people people. They're often good at motivating others, organizing, and communicating. They tend to get along well with others. Many are empathetic, that means they have the innate ability to put themselves in another person's shoes. And they're intuitive, they have an intuition and a, a good sense of perceiving and perception about the world around them. An interpersonal learner might l utilize their leadership abilities, hey, as a student council member or as an organizer of a food draft. Think about that. They, they, li they like to employ themselves, utilize themselves to the betterment of mankind. Now, the difference between interpersonal, those are your social butterflies, and intrapersonal, some of us know ourselves extremely well. And you know what? We're, we're hyper-talented in, in understanding and capitulating upon our strengths and weaknesses <clears throat> or limitations. Intrapersonal learners are thoughtful and reflective. These are, and, and see, I'd like to consider myself an INFJ and MBTI. That's someone who is just deeply uh, critical of themselves and the world around them, and they tend to spend a lot of time um, in the think tank of life and in thinking about whys and the hows, not necessarily the who, what, when, where, but, 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 but the application, the science of life, if you will. Now, natural learners can adjust to and adapt they're, it, it's exactly what it says, folks. Nature, naturalist. They love, they understand how the world works. There's those social cues, those, those, um, those community skills that the street smarts, if you will, that some of us have and some of us don't. Some of us uh, have acquired the skill set through our networking community. Some of us live in nuclear households. The students live in nuclear households where they have aunties and cousins and, and uh, stepsisters. And, and you know what? The family is not your prototypical, you know, uh, 1950s family. It just doesn't work out that way. And they're street smart. So they need to um, they're actually incredibly intelligent in understanding how systems work. They're really good rule followers because they can identify rules as they're, be, as they're being set, and especially with nonverbal cues. Now, uh, last but not least, let's talk about the existential learners. <laughs> now, these are your deep thinkers. They have the ability to contemplate big ideas. They're analytical. They have an explicit concern with the spiritual or the personnel around them. Now, this wraps up one part of differentiation uh, differentiation as I see it the multiple intelligences and you you need to try it before you buy it baby 
practice what you preach. Howard Garner had it going on. We'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.